While Pokemon is the biggest media franchise in the world today, its creator company, Game Freak, had humble beginnings. It started not as a company, but as a self-published magazine ran by a game fanatic with poor grades and an artist kicked out of his home. What drove them both forward was the same thing, passion for the arcade. Despite the long odds and society's expectations, these two forged onwards in order to create something they loved, and that would go on to change the world. Before Game Freak was a company, or even a magazine, it was a twinkle in the eye of a young man who loved bugs and video games. A boy who wanted to share that love, even if he had to find a way to do it all by himself. This is the tale of one Satoshi Tajiri, the real Game Freak. Born in 1965, Satoshi Tajiri grew up in Machida, Tokyo. Despite what his adult career would become, Tajiri did not grow up surrounded by technology at all. Machida was one of the few rural towns in Tokyo with forests and lakes for him to explore, and that's where he occupied himself as a kid. And if there was one thing to know about these woods, it was that they were full of bugs if he knew where to find them. And oh boy did Tajiri find them. The woods were the place he spent most of his early years, completely enraptured in bug catching. The tiny creatures captured his interest like nothing else. Tajiri loved them so much that the other kids would affectionately call him Dr. Bug. Tajiri's enthusiasm was infectious, and he dearly loved the little critters. He wanted to share that love with everyone, talking about bugs at length with friends, studying them, and even making presentations about them at school. As a child, I wanted to be an entomologist. Insects fascinated me, and as I searched for more, I would find more. If I put my hand in a river, I would get a crayfish, put a stick underwater and make a hole, look for bubbles, and there were more creatures. Bug collecting as a hobby for young kids is a cultural staple of many areas in Japan, even to this day. But Tajiri was clearly ecstatic about it beyond normal. He'd spend hours, days, even weeks thinking up new ways to bait, find, and catch bugs. It was definitely for the best though. Tajiri's bug manic phase wasn't fueled just by his interest in the critters, but because it was something he could share and bond with other kids over. Maybe if it wasn't for the hobby, Tajiri wouldn't have had as many chances to make friends. But everything good must come to an end, and like every kid, Tajiri was forced to leave behind his hobby. Not because he grew older, but because his world was about to change. In the 1960s, much of his population more than doubled and the rural city transformed. Green fields were paved and made into roads and fish ponds were drained. The forest gave way to buildings. In under a decade, the natural spaces that Tajiri would roam so often and the mysterious critters were gone. Tajiri realized during this time that kids wouldn't be able to experience what he did in his own childhood. They would no longer be able to feel the thrill of finding rare bugs, or be able to bond with their friends over it. For someone who cared so deeply about connecting with others, that realization... hit pretty hard. Soon, Tajiri had to dedicate his time to studying instead of bug collecting, and it wasn't easy. Tajiri had a bit of a rough time at school. It was clear he wasn't the best student. Keeping focus was hard, and his grades weren't stellar. It wasn't all bad, though. Despite losing access to his original passion, Tajiri was given an entirely new one when he tried out one of the newest buildings in his city. A brand new arcade! It was love at first token. The arcade was popular with kids, but there was something special between Tajiri and the arcade. He played every chance he could, even running there during any breaks he could get during school hours. Tajiri played in practice until he was well known for being able to play longer than anyone, without needing to buy extra tokens. His skill was undeniable, and Tajiri actually became a bit of a local legend within the arcade. And no, this is not an exaggeration. Tajiri was known in that arcade, and the owner definitely appreciated the patronage. After all, the boy had to spend money to get all their practice time in, and any business owner would be grateful indeed. How grateful, you ask? Well, let's put it this way. Tajiri played at the arcade so much that the owner eventually gifted him a Space Invaders cabinet. Yes, an entire cabinet, as big as the ones on screen right now. Tajiri just got to... take it home! Talk about reciprocity, huh? But where his newfound hobby gave him a lot of joy, it also started to give him trouble at home and school. It was already established that Tajiri's school life was nothing to write home about, but when you put kids and video games together, well, we all know what happens. Tajiri would sometimes skip class to go to the arcade, and his grades suffered even more for that. 
The Japanese education system has historically been very strict, so Tajiri's performance and truant behavior stood out in a bad way. To his teachers, he was a lazy bum. To his family, his hobby was turning him into a delinquent. It wasn't just video games, either. Tajiri was also exposed to a lot of anime and pop culture after the population boom of Machida, and he was all in on all sorts of media, much to the displeasure of those around him. To his parents and teachers, Tajiri was starting to look like a lost cause. But in reality, Tajiri was actually making the most out of his hobbies, because while his regular school and professional prospects weren't looking good to those around him, he had started his own business while still in high school. And that business was exactly what he always loved the most, sharing his passion, but this time in the form of a magazine. Might have even heard its name before, Game Freak. Game Freak magazine was a labor of love. No, really, Tajiri created it because he loved games a lot and really, really wanted to talk about them at length. It didn't help that there was no real media about games at the time for Tajiri to sink his teeth in either. All the knowledge and skill Tajiri had developed for video games at his arcade sessions left him with a wealth of knowledge and strategies, tips, secrets, and easter eggs in many popular games. Pac-Man, Space Invaders, Donkey Kong, he had something to share about each and every one of them. He began writing tips and tricks on his favorite games, how to reach new high scores and find secrets. He stapled those handwritten pages together, and in 1983, he published the very first Game Freak magazine to be stocked in local newspaper stands. As you can see, the magazines were entirely handmade. The covers of Game Freak were initially hand-drawn by Tajiri himself, and later repeated using a copy machine. The magazine rapidly fostered an audience of gaming enthusiasts who were growing eager to read more of Tajiri's work. It wasn't the only one who yearned for more quality video game media, so when he showed he could walk the walk, he found a loyal and eager audience. Game Freak had it all. News about video game releases, strategy guides, and everything about arcade culture in a way that had not been explored before, even in official publications. That's right, it was the first dedicated video game magazine in Japan, even predating Famitsu by a few years. From local newspaper stands, Game Freak started being distributed to more distant prefectures through mail order delivery. Tajiri had to recruit his family to help him mail all of them. Game Freak seemed to be picking up, but it wasn't what Tajiri's family wanted for him. While he focused all of his energy and spare time on the magazine, his parents' concern grew with every passing day. They were very unhappy when Tajiri clearly struggled to even finish high school. And it didn't stop there. Near the end of his high school years, Tajiri dropped the bombshell that he had no plans of going to college or finding himself a regular career. He was only interested in pursuing what he loved, but that did not sit well with his family at all. Disregarding college and normal career is a shock even today, but in 1980s Japan? Tajiri might as well have told his parents he planned to go live in the wild, but he trusted his dreams, and Game Freak as well. Game Freak was more than just the first taste of success Tajiri would have in the video game industry. It allowed him to share his passion with many different people, and it also allowed him to meet a lifelong friend who'd go on to change the gaming world alongside him. Game Freak needed an illustrator, and it was that need that led Satoshi Tajiri to meet one Ken Sugimori. Sugimori was having a tough time when he first found out about Game Freak. He'd been kicked out of his home by his family due to, and tell me if this sounds familiar, wanting to become a professional illustrator instead of pursuing a regular career. He saw the Game Freak magazine at a shop and liked what he saw. He contacted Tajiri and offered his talents to Game Freak as an illustrator, even moving to live closer to Tajiri once he was accepted into the team. After all, he had already been kicked out from where he was before. The only choice was to go all in. As for Tajiri, he was true to his own word. He never went on to finish university, although thankfully he didn't have a fallout with his family. He went on to finish a two-year course in electronics and computer science, but when his father insisted on trying to get him a job at Tokyo Electric Power Company, he refused. He'd do what he'd love, and that was the end of it. Game Freak continued to grow and reach, and each issue improved on the last as others began to contribute to the magazine, including one Junichi Masada. These contributors and Satoshi Tajiri would often come together to, of course, discuss video games. They had been discussing video games for a few years already, writing about the media and gathering experience. To Game Freak, it was pretty obvious what made a good game, and even more obvious what made a bad one. And to their displeasure, there were more and more of the latter in recent years. 
It truly bothered to Jerry that the quality of video games had been declining, and the rest of the team agreed. But what could they do about it? The very same thing that Tajiri did before, of course, by taking matters into his own hands. The only way to improve quality was to do it themselves. And so the next chapter of Game Freak's journey began as it evolved from being a small independent video game magazine publisher to becoming something more. With Satoshi Tajiri, Ken Sugimori, and Junichi Masuda as the founders, it was the birth of Game Freak, the video game development company. It seemed like a huge leap to take for Tajiri and the team. As shocking as it might be to say out loud, writing about video games and creating them on exactly transferable skills. So how did Tajiri expect things to work out with such a shift in profession? The answer is that he'd done it before. Kinda. In his middle school days, at the height of his arcade obsession, Tajiri had actually already entered two video game concept contests. The first one was held by Universal Studios and led Tajiri to come up with his first ever original game idea, Midnight Crows, or Dark Knight Crows. Tajiri didn't win, but he did get a pretty snazzy keychain out of it. The other contest was held by Sega in 1981, and this time Tajiri actually won first prize with a new idea called Spring Stranger. He went to Sega HQ in person to receive the prize money, and being in the very building of one of the titans of the video game industry might have left an impression or two on the young aficionado. Side note, Tajiri also gave half of the prize money to his parents as thanks for putting up with him. <laughs> and uh, maybe get rid of the delinquent accusations. Now, making video game concepts shouldn't be enough to break into the industry, but they'd make it work. Even though it had been almost a decade since he dabbled in game development, Tajiri was eager to get started. It wasn't easy though. Tajiri and the Game Freak team had to basically reverse engineer a Famicom by tearing it apart to see how it worked, and of course, it was entirely out of pocket. What was also paid out of pocket was a copy of Nintendo's Family Basic Programming Kit, which Tajiri used to learn programming himself. Overall, it took two years for Game Freak to become well acquainted enough with programming to really create something. Mind you, all of this was done without funding and without support from any big companies, amidst having to keep the lights on. Game Freak was not established in the industry, and its magazine days didn't really hold any weight here. Whatever they could do to get their foot in the door, they needed to do it without help. And what came from the new company's first project was Quinty, known in the West as Mendel Palace. It was an arcade-style game for the Famicom. The inspiration was obvious as it was always meant to look like arcade games from Namco, being very simple and very cute. Quinty wasn't just inspired by Namco games either. Tajiri actively wanted Game Freak's first project to be published by the company, being a huge fan himself. And when Game Freak pitched Quinty, Namco accepted. It sold 200,000 copies worldwide, raising enough funds to solidify Game Freak's place in the market. Over the next few years, Game Freak would grow at a rapid rate. The second game was called Smartball, it's actually a jelly bean, but okay, which was a colorful and fun action platformer. It even had simple story of jealousy between brothers, which was entirely removed for the Western release. The first adventure of Jerry the Jelly Bean, yes, that's the bean's name, keep up, was well received, but Game Freak's third title was the real leap, Yoshi for the Famicom and Game Boy. In only three years, Game Freak started to work with official Nintendo intellectual properties. It didn't end there, either. Mario and Wario, Magical Taruto-kun, and Pulseman were all games developed by Game Freak in its early days. If you're curious about these titles and haven't heard of them, make sure to let us know in the comments if you want to see them covered in another video. With Tajiri as the director for almost all of the company's games, in five years Game Freak would carve itself a place in the game development market. The first few years were more than fruitful and gave Game Freak quite the repertoire. After a stumbling road, it seemed that finally, Satoshi Tajiri had made it. That was far from the end for Game Freak though. Before the magnum opus was complete, the company would face one of the most harrowing development cycles in the industry at the time. The development of Pokemon. But that's a story that we've already told, and we'd love for you to check it out. Be sure to click the box to the right to see that story, and let us know some of your favourite Game Freak games in the comments below. And of course, be sure to like and subscribe.